you know, I think investors and and others in our in our business often move in, in the herd mentality. Um, and that's a great way to get in trouble. So we work really, really hard to be disciplined and kind of stick to what we think are our fundamentals. So that's one thing we've learned. And two, real constant focus on execution. Um, you know, especially on the development side, it's important on the value add side as well, but it's Harder to add value, I think, in value add than than it is on in ground up. Uh, but you really have to to be experienced. You have to be very focused on the details. You got to be very focused on timeline. Um, so I think you know we've continued to get better at that over the years. But but you know can't forget about execution. Is you don't just make your money on the buy. People often say in real estate it's all about basis, and you just make your money on the buy. Especially with ground up, you have to be able to execute. Uh, Because it's a lot of work and it's hard work. Sean, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for having me. I've enjoyed doing some research on you the last couple of days, and I thought a good place to start would just be kind of telling me how you got into real estate and how you found this career, or did it find you? So... uh... (laughs) It's always scary when someone says they've done a little bit of research on you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I, you know, a, a couple of different ways. Um, one, you know, I'd always been interested in cities and the urban environment, and um, I'd worked in the in the political realm, um, and so that was always a passion of mine. Um, my first, uh, you know, kind of first job was in the White House, but in my my first professional job after law school was at a big law firm, and um, I worked in a, a real estate group at a big law firm and, you know, really got kind of re-engaged and, and enjoyed that and enjoyed being a part of something very tangible um, and then really kind of saw the opportunity to invest uh, in communities and, you know, build housing and help be a part of kind of positive growth in a community, but also kind of engage all the business and investing skills. So to me, it was a kind of the best of both worlds. I got to do well by doing good and it really and enjoyed the career. Is there anything you learned um, being in the White House that transferred over to running a business? Uh, there was a lot of things. I mean, the, the, the most many interesting things about the White House, but one was just a pure kind of work ethic. I mean, the hours that, that you know, people crank uh, in the White House is like nothing I've ever seen, including being a you know junior lawyer at a major firm or working with invest you know and kind of with investment bankers, um, and and it's all you know done with a kind of a public ethic and you know there's a, a set of values there and people do want to change the world and they're trying to do good and it doesn't mean everybody's perfect or motives are always pure but it was pretty inspiring to see you know how people you know, approach to problem and that kind of commitment and effort they put into it when they could frankly go make a lot more money in the private sector. And they've, you know, they decided to, to forego that to, to try to move the agenda for, for something they believed in. And so, you know, we've tried to bring a little bit of that ethic as well, the City View. I, you know, I think we're a, a mission-driven firm. Our first job is to get returns and results for our investors, and we focus on that. But there's different ways to do that, and we try to do it in the right way. And I think some of that ethic comes from the the early kind of White House years. I love it. I've I've done almost three hundred of these. I've never actually talked to someone that was in the White House. Um, maybe one more question. I didn't know we'd go here, but when they make these bills that are like a, a thousand pages long, who writes them? All these lawyers just get them together really quick, or how do they crank out something that big that quick? Look, they have um, large teams in Congress uh, on these committees. They're experts at what they do. A lot of them are lawyers by training. Um, they also have, you know, uh, they also have uh, counsel that they work with, and this is their expertise in what they do. And so, uh, yeah, it's a tr- again, it's a tremendous amount of work. And you know, it's funny. There's a lot of, you know, there's a, it's very easy to knock politicians and elected officials, and I get it. And there's there's plenty of bad examples, but. I will say from, you know, personally working with many of them over the years, the vast majority of people are trying to do the right thing and they're working very hard and, uh, and you know, and, and they're, they're kind of focused on a positive outcome. And so to me, I do find it inspiring. All right. And so now you've gotten into housing. Can you just describe a little bit about what City View does and how, and how you view the company? Sure. Um, so we're a, a multifamily specialist, a sharpshooter. 
Uh, and we, we've always worked in housing when we founded the firm in 2003. Um, the focus was on housing exclusively. At that time, it was for sale housing, and we later pivoted to, to multifamily during the GFC. And the thesis was that there was um, a generation of young people who weren't going to want to just drive to the next freeway off ramp and you know buy a home with a white picket fence in a public house in a in a you know public home builder development but you know there were people that want to live in cities are going to you know be in the action be near their job be near culture and nightlife and restaurants and bars etc and there wasn't enough housing being built for those people uh, and so we founded the firm with this concept of we were going to create what we called infill housing. That's a term that's now fallen out of art, um, but kind of centrally located, denser, um, you know, housing. And, and that could, you know, in California now, that looks primarily like apartments. Uh, and that was the that was the focus. And, and that's how, you know, we got involved in it. And, you know, when we started, there were three or four of us and we now have 150. Um, we focus um, not just in California, but all over the western half of the country, kind of west of the Mississippi. So coastal California, major cities, Pacific Northwest, uh, all, all the way over to Denver and Boulder, and then down through Salt Lake and Phoenix into Texas. Uh, and that's our that's what we do. And, and, you know, we do the work ourselves. We're not an allocator. Uh, we started out as an allocator, but made the decision in 2008 and 9 as we were looking at at operating and development partners that were bankrupt or couldn't focus anymore. We ended up taking a lot of projects back and doing them ourselves and realized that we just weren't close enough to the real estate. So we decided to really kind of build out the platform and started out with building out a development team. And then we moved into construction management. And then about five years ago, added property management to it. So, um, so that's who we are. And, you know, we continue to kind of remain focused like a laser on this asset class in those markets. Um, and, and everything you do is ground up, no acquisition, all ground up. No, actually, we're um, it, it, that's the most common misconception about us. But about half of our track record is buying existing assets, whether that's core plus or value add. Um, and the other half is ground up development. Um, I would say that's more of our brand. People know us more for the ground up because it's it's more visible, it's sexier. It's the kind of pictures we put on our website. But you know, half of what we we do and have done is is existing acquisitions. Okay. Um, how do you all? You mentioned some of the markets you're in. How do you guys think about the locations you want to buy and the types of properties that you want to buy? What matters to you? So, you know, we're fundamentals driven company. So the first thing we're looking at and picking markets is is for some sort of significant supply and demand imbalance. You know, so as as our team is kind of analyzing our markets, we're looking at places where, you know, the where's the population gonna grow faster than the rest of the country? Where are we gonna add more jobs? Are they good jobs? Are they jobs that are gonna drive higher incomes? And so we find markets that have strong demand and then weak supply. So where are barriers to entry high? Where is it hard to build? Where do you have a lot of regulation? Uh, because a lot of people will shy away from those markets and go to uh, you know maybe markets like the Sun Belt where it's a lot easier to build, but that can lead to the, the problems like they're having there now with significant oversupply. So you no, know, that that's how we pick kind of the macro markets and the minor markets. We are frankly picking neighborhoods that that we would want to live in. Um, you know, is it close to transit? Is it um, an up and coming neighborhood? You know, we like to always, as we're running around doing our due diligence on projects, you know, we're looking for the, the coolest new coffee shop um, because often that coffee shop will go in into a neighborhood that's transitioning and, and maybe land prices aren't as high as they're going to be in a year or two years or five years. So, you know, we love great micro locations that um, you know, have some energy to them. It's a place where millennials are going to want to live. Uh, and, and, you know, that's how we, that's how we pick them. And when you're finding a development site, are you typically finding sites that are already entitled and ready to go? Or are you looking at sites that need, uh, like maybe you go under contract and you're going to have to entitle it before closing or kind of all the above? Yeah. So it, it's definitely all of the above. Um, one thing we generally don't do is, buy a piece of land that's unentitled and then take it through an entitlement process. 
Um, we will um, often option a piece of land, um, take it through some sort of entitlement process, uh, and then uh, you know fully kind of design the project and then break ground on it as we're closer to having a GNP and permits. Um, that's a very common structure. We've probably done that 40 times over the last 20 years. Um, and it's great because you can you know, add significant value uh, in that process. Um, there's times too that we've you know kind of bought deals that are fully entitled and we think it's there's still some value there um, and it's a, a particularly good location. We'll do that and, and build ground up. But you know we've developed, I think, a expertise as a firm um, doing entitlements. and um, we have a lot of experience. you know we have the former planning director for for Los Angeles who served on under four different mayors. Uh, on our team. He's been here since 2007. Uh, I sat on the City Planning Commission uh, in LA uh, for five years, uh, uh, you know, in kind of 2008 to 2012. And that doesn't mean, by the way, that we have some sort of secret sauce or we can get something done that other people can't. But I do think it helps us make good choices about, you know, what's possible, what does a community want, what do elected officials want, how can we find that that you know, thread that needle, uh, so we can we can find a good project uh, and kind of make good choices. And then, you know, and then we work very closely with communities when we're doing that. You know, we we, you know, I learned this on the planning commission, sitting on the other side, watching developers and architects and others come present. You see a lot of people that just aren't very good at it, and they haven't been respectful of the communities they're in. They they don't think highly of those communities. They think they can run them over and. That's a recipe for disaster from our from our perspective. So when we are entitling a project, we do tons of community meetings. Uh, we meet with the elected officials very early on in the process, understand what their vision is. Um, and that doesn't mean you can always give people everything they want, but it, I think it it you know it allows you to make better and more informed decisions, and you have a much higher chance of of, of success if you do that. Okay, I want to drill in a little bit more on entitlements. Um, I, I I would I would start by just saying um, from your experience, like if and 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 we buy industrial now at my firm, but we used to develop, and so I'll just make sure we're on the same page when I say, is it fair to say that maybe the the length to entitle, maybe since you started in the great financial crisis to where we are today, like maybe what used to take a year or two now takes almost double that. It seems like everybody I talk to around the country just getting entitlements takes longer. Do you experience that? Uh, not significantly because it's always been hard in our markets. <laughs> so it's always taken kind of 12 to 24 months to get entitlements. Um, uh, I would say that hasn't extended. Um, and part of that is in a lot of our markets, there's at least a recognition that we have a housing crisis and you need to build more. So I, I would say you even get maybe a little bit more winded your back in terms of you know the uh, government wanting to, to you know to get the entitlements done and that being said you know communities are very sensitive to traffic and to noise and to other things so um, that can slow down a project and i would say the you know community opposition and intensity to housing generally has increased over the last few years and and part of that is you know traffic's been getting worse and part of that probably is social media and the ability to connect and those kinds of things um, but i would say it's always been tough in our market. That's part of what we like because there's not as much supply and, and we feel like we can really add value. Uh, but, you know, the community piece is, is a tricky one. And so from your experience, like in the markets in L.A., and the, there there is a strong desire at the city level to build more housing. There is. It's, it's a major initiative of, you know, we have a new mayor here, Mayor Bass, and she's very committed to to housing, she's very committed to homelessness. You know, she's she's housed fourteen thousand people in her first six months, which is pretty staggering when you think about it. Um, but she understands in her team that the only way we're going to get out of this issue in the long run is is not just to buy more hotels and motels, but to actually build housing. And again, not just for the homeless, but affordable housing and workforce and market rate housing. And so um, there's absolutely a, a you know a, a focus and an understanding on that. Um, what we try to do at, at City View and also in our kind of civic endeavors is to help, you know, educate elected officials and policymakers about the best way to do that. How do you really supercharge a, a housing development plan? Um, so we're not just, you know, building a few hundred units here or there, but building the tens of thousands that we need to every year to 
in order to kind of address uh, our housing needs. Yeah, I know you. I, I read that you uh, you co chair the LA Coalition, which are business leaders across the economy, and I I would imagine you know homelessness is probably a big uh, topic. Like, do you have opinions on not just in LA but just in general? How do you tackle this problem? Because um, you go to a lot of these cities, and and the cost to develop public housing is still expensive. Like, I I don't know what I read on LA, but maybe it's eight hundred grand a door or something, or yeah. something close <laughs> to that to build. Yeah. Like, what is the solution to this it, besides just housing? Is it mental health uh, care? How, how, what's the look? It, it's it's in, I'm not an expert on this, but but I will say that it, it's a multifaceted problem, right? You have housing unaffordability at its core because you just haven't built enough housing, right? So there's more people who want to live in housing than exist. So that's the core issue. Um, then you have mental health issues, right? And 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 that's gotten worse than COVID because, like here in LA County. Right, that which handles mental health. The, the city doesn't handle it. The county handles it. You know, they for years they weren't meeting with people in person because of COVID. Right, so you had things get worse and worse and worse on that front. There's also addiction issues that you're dealing with. Um, so it's incredibly complicated. Um, you know, on the on the building new housing front. I mean, you mentioned the eight hundred thousand dollar figure. That's a, a figure the LA Times reported of what it costs to build homeless and affordable housing. Um, per unit, which is staggering because we can build at City View a brand new market rate, you know, building with, you know, a rooftop deck and a, a gym that looks like Equinox in it at 500,000 a unit. Um, and so that's another thing that we're trying to, that, to help the mayor and her team and other elected officials understand how can you produce housing at all levels uh, more affordably. Um, so it's it's a conundrum, and it's it's there's no silver bullet, there's no simple solution, but it's something we all have to work on, and something the LA Coalition is focused on is uh, is this critical issue. I mean, if you look at at surveys as to why businesses leave, right? Something we've been concerned about in in LA. I know in Texas they got a lot of businesses coming there, right? We're, we're always concerned about why they're leaving LA. If you look at the surveys, that the number one reason people leave, it's not taxes, it's not regulation, uh, it's because the people who work at those businesses can't afford housing. Um, so it's a, it's a critical, not just kind of, you know, issue for humanity, it's a critical issue for economic development uh, in all these cities. How is the LA market doing right now? Uh, it, it, Texas, it, it, we keep hearing recession, but you know, I got back from New York City today. Uh, it seemed like things are moving and hustling up there. Texas seems to be doing the same. My California buddies seem to think things are going good. What's your perspective on it? No, it, it, it's the same as yours, Chris. I mean, um, you know, you can't get a restaurant reservation in LA. It's packed with people. It's the, there's traffic because everybody's out and about. The malls are busy. Um, so LA is doing really well, uh, you know, at least on that metric, right? I mean, there's plenty of people who are facing challenges here as well, but on that metric, it's doing well. And like you have, you haven't had significant job losses in LA. You have incredibly diverse economy. You know, it used to be kind of aerospace and entertainment once upon a time. Now you have a ton of manufacturing jobs. You have a lot of tech jobs, uh, content, gaming, healthcare is, I think, the largest uh, um, largest asset kind of provider of jobs. So um, it's very, very strong on the demand front, um, kind of despite the, you know, the, what you read in the media about everybody's leaving LA and it's hollowing out. It's really not the experience of those of us who are here. I was in LA. Uh, my TCU Horn Frogs played at SoFi Stadium for the national championship. I had a amazing time in LA. It was it was it was, it was really cool. Well what, what did you what did you think of this of our new stadium? Oh, it's unbelievable. <laughs> I mean it was unbelievable. And it was pouring rain when we left. And so we actually like it was adults playing in the rain. We were for a second, we tried strain dry. And then we said, Nope, we're going all in on this rain. And it was like an hour walk back to our bus. And, and we had a blast. But no, the stadium was incredible. It was it was it was world class. Yeah, that's good to hear. Right? Stan Kroenke and Kevin Demo from the Rams did a great job building that. And it's a it's a treasure. We're big Rams fans here. So we spent a lot of time at that stadium. What, what are you in just, are you, do you look for sites all over LA or specific pockets of LA or, uh, suburbs or are you kind of everywhere? Yeah, no, no. We're, we're looking for specific pockets and suburbs. I'll tell you where we don't build in LA and haven't in 20 years, despite being based here is in downtown LA. Um, 
we've never built down there because we don't do high rise. We think that's an asset class that's, um, you know, on the riskier kind of edge of the, of the spectra when it comes to, to housing. Um, but we like to build near jobs and transit. So we're in Koreatown, we're in Silver Lake and Echo Park, we're near USC, we're just completing 300 units there and, and opening that in the next few weeks. Um, we're on the west side, we're in Culver City, um, we're in West Hollywood. So we're in markets that um, are vibrant, um, where again, we're kind of millennials would want to live. Um, and, and if we're building new product, it has to be a market where the rents can sustain the cost of new housing, which is not an expensive land's expensive, but so is labor and so are materials. And obviously interest rates have tripled in the last year. Um, so it has to be a market where they can sustain rents to, you know, to get an adequate return for investors. Do you see any similarities to what's going on today to what you experienced in 08, 09 as you were getting into development or is it two totally different kind of? You know, it's, it's, it's different and it's the same. I mean, we, um, we haven't seen product really start, distressed product really start to move yet. It's starting to happen. We track every deal that goes to market and, and do kind of at least a desktop underwriting on it within our markets and then deep dive into ones that make sense. And I would say, you know, Q4 and Q1 was very slow. Uh, you didn't see much trade. You've, you've seen a lot more multifamily uh, hit uh, the market, I would say, in the last kind of six to eight weeks. And you're seeing even the, the ask be at a pretty significant discount to replacement cost. Um, and the, and the, the, uh, the bid's probably going to end up being lower. So, um, so you know that that looks similar to the to the GFC, um, but the GFC was caused by you know wide scale job losses, right? I mean, it was caused by a lot of things in the financial reason. But you were, I think, when you know when Barack Obama became president in January of '09, you know we were losing eight hundred thousand jobs a month, right? Now, but but here we are in 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 this disruption downturn, whatever you want to call it, and we have a you know. Three and a half percent, you know, employment rate and nine and a half million open jobs. So it, it feels very different from that perspective. I mean, you, you said it earlier. Everybody's talking about recession, but but everywhere you go, it seems to be pumping. So it's it's a weird, you know, it's so it's different in that sense. Yeah, people keep saying hard landing, soft landing, but nobody's. I've actually never heard the de definition of what a soft landing would actually be or what a hard landing. I think they're just terms we use, but this one feels kind of soft right now to me. I haven't been through it, Tom. I mean, what we think of we think of hard landing as significant job losses, you know, and you see real layoffs and unemployment rate gets up, you know, goes from three and a half percent to six or seven or eight percent. To us, that's a that's a hard landing, and you know, this is a very funky one, and and it's gonna be interesting what the Fed you know does in in July, and we're just praying that inflation stays low because it, it seems to obviously be really persistent and is driving, you know, these higher interest rates, which is really impactful on, at least on a, the real estate business. Are you seeing anything as relates to building costs? Are they, have they stabilized? Are they coming down or holding firm at where they're, where they are? You know, it's interesting. We've seen them stabilize pretty significantly over the last six months or so. Um, but we just did an analysis in LA County from the beginning of COVID until, um, until the end of last year, costs were 38% higher um, to give you a sense of how much things shot through the roof. Now it seems to me that, that you know, you don't see costs going down. I mean, you, you, you've seen, you know, lumber go down and some other commodities, obviously shipping costs are way down, uh, but labor seems to be, to be moderating and look more like two to 4% annual inflation versus five, 10, 15%. So um, I think that's good. I do think there's gonna need to be some reduction in costs in order to really start building multifamily in a in a you know in a big way again because interest costs are have gone up so much that when we're looking at new development deals which don't make sense today interest costs can be 70 to 100 percent of what the land cost is now right i mean in your pro forma which is staggering so then when you also have um you know obviously high building costs um, that would come out of the land traditionally, but land is only 10 to 15 percent generally of the of the cost of a budget in a multifamily deal, unlike industrial or others, where it's going to be much higher. 
And so because of that, you can't reduce the land enough to make up for that difference. Like no one's going to give their land away for free. So you're going to have to see some moderation on the cost front and reduction, as well as interest rates to come down, I think, to, to see kind of a boom in multifamily development again. Yeah, you just might have just kind of answered it. But my next question was just what would it take to for a, a development deal in this market right now to make sense for you all? Well, for us, you know, we're always very focused on yield on cost uh, because that's uh, you know, people can play games with the IRR and other metrics. But yield on cost is, you know, if, if it's numbers that you believe in is a good metric. And, you know, we've expanded our expectations on yield on cost like 100 to 150 basis points of of what they were kind of, you know, pre, you know, pre summer of last year. Um, in urban markets, um, and you're seeing it. You know, not a lot, but you know, we we're breaking ground on a you know a 267 unit deal across from SpaceX here in LA, and you know, it's the best yield on cost I think I've ever seen in the LA market. And that's on you know real costs with a GMP and a, a loan with real interest rates and uh, real rents. You know, we have you know 40 plus buildings here in LA. We know what. What rents you can get and what neighborhoods for what product type and um so that that's that's encouraging um i'd like to see more of those uh going forward but it, it always takes a little bit of a time when you have this sort of shift that we have today in terms of um you know the economy and financing and other things for their to, to close that bid ask spread so you're starting to see it but i think you'll see a lot more in the next six to 18 months to the extent you can share, was there anything in particular about that deal that that yield the best um, return on cost or was just a good buy? Or is there something particular? SpaceX ended up coming there unexpectedly or something? You know, it, it was a, a really good buy. Um, right. So, um, it's you know, we're we're an experienced developer here. We you know, we build more than anybody else in L.A. County. And so, you know, we have good relationships with GCs and subs and and. I think we get, you know, we get the best pricing that's out there. Um, you know, we're not getting some great, you know, some special deal, but I do think we get the best pricing that's out there. And this is a very high demand market. I mean, SpaceX is a great location as a whole. That area of El Segundo and and um, uh, and Hawthorne has, you know, uh, you know, companies like Ring have moved there. You know. Um, they have kind of a whole tech hub. It's got a whole aerospace hub. It's got the kind of new space hub that's there. And there's only one apartment building um, in the whole area. Uh, so there's a ton of, you know, I remember when we were underwriting this deal and we were driving some investors down there and, you know, I, I said, you know, asked them to meet me at eight in the morning. I said, Why don't we meet, you know, at 10 or 11. I said, because I want to show you something at eight in the morning. So we, we met at the Starbucks and we drove down the street and there's a big parking garage across from SpaceX. Uh, right next to where our site is. And we had to wait in the crosswalk because hundreds of people were walking out of the parking garage into the building. And I said, there you go. That That's the thesis for this deal. Those people would rather live here than where they do and have to drive in and park. And and so that's, that's part of what's driving, I think, the very strong kind of yield on cost on that deal. So you pull up to the site and everybody is walking across that I guess are SpaceX employees. What like from an investor standpoint, who's sitting there with you, like kind of how did that advance the discussion? Was that a deciding moment for whether to do the deal or like what did it mean to them? Yeah, it was It was trying to put a visual to our thesis, which was we were, you had an area that had an incredibly strong employer base, lots of jobs, um, lots of millennials who are going to want to live in apartments um, nice apartments, um, and that there was no other housing, so they all had to drive in. And SpaceX had to build this huge garage across the street from their campus uh, to accommodate everybody. So, you know, our thesis is: look, if we can build a terrific, you know, Class A apartment building next door with you know a rooftop deck and incredible amenities and gyms and everything else, fire pits and all of that, that people want to live here. I mean, it, this is your renter, basically. Yeah. Um, and so that's, you know, I think things like that, you know, drive the, you know, drive that investment thesis and, have, you know, drove that attractive yield on cost. I've never asked this question before um, in almost 300 episodes, so you'll be the first, but you kind of just said it. When you're thinking, if somebody, some of the folks that listen to this are uh, new developers or 
maybe they've, they're raising money for the first time or the second time. What makes like a good tour to show equity a project? Obviously, everybody sends a deck, but you've toured equity across, you know, lots of projects. How do you conduct those tours? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. So um, we obviously focus on the neighborhood. I mean, real estate is a very hyper local business. And so um, we usually are, you know, me- meeting the investors, um, you know, not at the site, but somewhere nearby. We are then taking them on a tour of the neighborhood. You know, here's here's where all the jobs are. Here's where people go to to, you know, have lunch. Here's where they go to have coffee. Here's where they work out. Here's where they get their dry cleaning done. Get people a sense of, you know, who your renter is and how they live. And then we're going to look at some comps and we're saying, look, you know, here are three other buildings and, and we're going to, you know, take you inside there and show you, um, you know, what the finishes look like and what the amenities are and what kind of rents they pay. And we're going to, you know, ask the, the, you know, leasing agents, you know, what they think, what they're seeing in the market. Cause they're, they're right on the ground and you put all that together and, and, you know, in theory, it makes a, a strong investment thesis. Um, but it really, it really is very neighborhood and community focused. Speaking of neighborhood community focus, and I know the office market in LA maybe hit a little bit harder than other parts of the country. You're a developer. There's a conversation about, is there a office to resi play? Is that even a real thing or is it something that's on your radar? It's on our radar and we've looked at a bunch. It's really hard to actually pull off um, because you need a you need an office building that is of the right size, has the right floor plates. You have to think about things like plumbing. We have a lot of common area in office building that is is, is, is useful uh, uh, when you're building a re- when you're converting to residential. So we look at it. Um, but often, you know, especially if you're in more of a premier suburban location looking at office there. The best play is often to scrape the building and and you know add units you know kind of starting from scratch um, and we've you know we, we look at that as well uh, but it's it's we're gonna have to we're gonna have to figure out something to do with all of this empty office space I mean downtown LA now they're saying it's thirty to forty percent um, that's just not sustainable uh, so um, we do have to you know we have to figure this out kind of as an industry and as a society but. It's very difficult in a lot of cases to convert to uh, just to convert pure office to to resi. Yeah, no, it's uh, and even if you can, it's even doing it at scale. It's just kind of a one off situation, so it's hard to build a predictable strategy around it. That's a great. It's a great talking point. I, I go a lot of places and I hear all these people who talk about this is what we're going to do, but actually executing it is a challenge. And you know, it's funny we. We've done it in the warehouse space. You know, we we did one of the first major projects in the arts district in LA, and we took an old furniture, the old Barker Brothers furniture warehouse, and converted it to three hundred units. So it was a massive play. And what we had to do with one of the buildings is actually cut a huge portion out of the middle of it and create a courtyard so we could create light for the units and some air, fresh air and those kinds of things. So it's, it's not for the faint of heart. That was a very successful project. And we were an early mover uh, in that neighborhood, but it's, you know, it's people think it's cheaper than building ground up and it's not. You've been doing this for since 20 or 2008. So almost 15 years. If you had to like think of one or two things that you go, man, we've gotten really good at this and, and didn't even, wasn't even on our radar in 2008 when we started. Like, What makes a great multifamily developer and operator from your perspective? Yeah, we've actually been doing this since 2003. Okay, so, 2003. Um, yeah, so, th- so for 20 years, I can't believe it's been that long. <laughs> um, so look, I, I think it's, it's a couple things. One is... Um, you got to be disciplined, right? It's very easy to get caught up in in the hype or what everybody's talking about, and and you know I think investors and and others in our in our business often move in in the herd mentality, um, and that's a great way to get in trouble. So we work really really hard to be disciplined and kind of stick to what we think are our fundamentals, uh, and and so that's that's one thing we've learned. And two, um, you know real constant focus on execution. 
Um, you know, especially on the development side, it's important on the value add side as well. But I, mean, I think value add is easier than development, um, and there's more people who do it, and it's it's, it's harder to add value, I think, in value add than than it is on in ground up. Uh, but you really have to to be experienced. You have to um, be very focused on the details. You got to be very focused on timeline. Um, so I think you know we've continued to get better at that over the years, but but you know, can't forget about execution. Is you don't just make your money on the buy. People often say in real estate, it's all about basis, and you just make your money on the buy. Especially with ground up, you have to be able to execute because uh, it's a lot of work and it's hard work. It's brutal. Um, if when you think about tech and amenities, are, is there anything? Well, maybe we'll just start with amenities. Is there anything from amenity standpoint? Maybe the question is things that you're doing now that you didn't used to do, or amenities that don't matter that everybody thinks matter. Like, how do you think about amenities in these projects today and going forward? Yeah, so so I think the the amenities that matter still are for. I mean, look, we're in warm weather markets generally, ex- except for Colorado, and um, but you know, rooftop deck is an incredibly important amenity. Right, people like to sit outside around a fire pit, and and um, that's an incredibly important. I think a great gym is an amenity for this generation. It's more health conscious. And we're often expanding gyms or even our value add projects. We have a project now in Portland um, in the East Burnside neighborhood. Um, and, you know, we came into that project and it was kind of a, a light value add strategy. It's only eight or nine years old. But we identified they had two big bike rooms and one of the big bike rooms uh, was on the street and no one used it. So we're actually making that into kind of a high-end gym. Um, so I think that's an incredibly important uh, amenity. I would say that, you know, I, common rooms, you know, we, we do them and they're nice, but that seems to be used less um, than, um, than people think, you know, that, that at least we see the money that's put into those kind of justifies. Um, Another common amenity that we do in all of our projects, and we did a pre-COVID and we've even ramped it up, uh, you know, since COVID is we have what we call CV Works, where we create kind of co-working space um, and make it very kind of nimble and flexible. So you can slide walls around and tables around and those kinds of things. And you, you put great Wi-Fi in there and great coffee. And um, again, that was popular pre-COVID because we always had a percentage of people that worked from home. But now with flex schedules, it's become incredibly popular. Um, And I'd say another interesting thing is on movie theater. So when we first started in this business, everybody had to put a movie screen theater with in your project with a big screen TV and a bunch of really, really comfortable chairs and a popcorn machine and make it really cool. And then I would say for a number of years, those were totally empty and no one used them. And just in the last year or two, we're getting a ton of demand for those again. So we're starting to see those designed again. And I don't know if it's it's the access to streaming services now that you can get in there and people want to sit in there and watch their shows. But it's, 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 you know, that's been kind of a back to the future moment for us is seeing kind of movie theater demand come back for projects. I love it. What about on the tech side? Um, anything you're implementing, whether it's apps or uh, how, how people view properties or tour properties, anything from a tech side? Yeah. So, so, so all, all the above, like we, we got, We've done a little bit of virtual leasing, you know, before COVID. We got really good at it during COVID, um, and uh, as a lot of people did. But, you know, for a lot of our projects, um, we attract people that are moving in from out of state. Um, And so that's been a really helpful tool. Um, Obviously, smart homes with climate controls and those kinds of things have have been, you know, a a core part of what we've done. But we've continued to ramp up, um, you know, latch and electronic systems for door locks and those kind of things, making your phone your key. And um, so, you know, we, we've, we're always out, um, you know, we're at all the trade shows looking at technology. We're driving around looking at our competitors to see what people put in. And I think that's something you want to stay at the front edge of. I, I don't, you don't always want to be at the bleeding edge of it because you don't want to be putting in buggy technology that's over-engineered and more, you know, more trouble than it's worth the more expensive than it's worth. But I do think you want to stay kind of on your front foot when it comes to technology that really enhances the lives of your residents or, or enhances, you know, the, the kind of their value system. You know, a lot, a lot of our 
millennials are concerned about, you know, our building's impact on the climate and how healthy is the building and are we being responsible? And so we try to incorporate that into our design and our features while still remembering that our first job is to deliver returns for our investors. So you don't want to do things that are inordinately expensive or or you don't get enough bang for the buck. What are like a couple things that are uh, that are financially prudent that are also good for the environment? I mean, de- definitely the, the climate control systems, right? So you're not, you're not, um, you know, wasting energy is, is really, really important. You know, one thing that we do at, at virtually all of our buildings is we get fit well certified, um, which is a really interesting program that's, you know, whereas LEED is more focused on kind of the investor community and those kinds of things, fit well is more focused on the experience of, of the renter and how are you making the building as healthy as possible for them. And so we go through that and that has to do with air filtration systems and lighting and, and kind of a bunch of other health focused amenities. And, and that's, um, that's something that we do. And it seems something that seems to resonate with uh, our invest with our tenants when they're coming into lease or when they decide whether or not to stay in the building. All right. Um, I guess we'll kind of, bring it into how are you how are you positioning yourself for the next few years um open for business looking for deals is there obviously the market shifted like you've been in this for 20 years and through multiple cycles how are you telling your team and what are you thinking about over the next couple of years sure so it's 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 a it's an interesting time it's really a tale of two cities on the operational front um assets are doing really well you know, we're 95% plus occupied across the portfolio. We're getting solid rent growth. We're getting high retention. Uh, concessions are down in the vast majority of our of our markets and projects. Um, so the assets are performing operationally, but you have this huge dysfunction and destabilization of the financial markets, right? With interest rates basically tripling. And so what we're focused on is, you know, a lot on asset management, which is, you know, kind of hand-to-hand combat, making sure that the assets we have continue to perform. Uh, and then on the on the kind of acquisition front, um, we're very much open for business. Uh, and although we haven't closed a new deal in a year, which is the longest we've gone even since the GFC, um, but that's been because, you know, there's, you've had this changing dynamic and it's been hard to get price discovery and, we want to be patient with our capital and with our, you know, with our discretionary capital and our JV capital. So we, um, so we've been very patient. But you know, we really think there's kind of two, you know, best ideas or major opportunities right now from from our perspective. One is this ability to buy things at a deep discount to replacement cost. Um, we haven't seen this sort of pricing opportunity really since the the GFC. Um, and not everything's trading yet, so it's very early. You know, we're in the early innings, as they would say, of that. But but we definitely think it's coming. Um, we track loan expirations uh, and um, a number of different factors. And you know, there's there's a lot of operators and you know and others who bought multifamily uh, in the last couple of years with variable rate debt. You know, they only put a two year cap on it because that's what was cheapest. Um, and they're underwater now, uh, and they're not getting enough rent growth uh, in order to to stay afloat. And so they're either going to need to buy another cap, or they're going to need to exit or recapitalize, or in some cases people are going to give things to banks. And so, you know, we're you know kind of a poised to take advantage of those opportunities and um, and you know find good uh, good deals for our investors. So that's one area in the value add front. Uh, the second area that we that we really like is uh, on the land front. You know, we are seeing some really interesting opportunities to not just buy land at a significant discount to where it was even six months ago, but really on much better terms. Uh, so you're able to to option land, take it through some sort of approval or light entitlement process do your design drawings, do your construction drawings, get your GMP, and then have the option to take down the land. Um, you know, we really like that strategy in uh, in this kind of market because in, in the places that we buy and build, you have this huge supply demand imbalance. Today, it's even going to be more the case in 18 or 24 months 
because no, nothing new is getting built because of financing costs right now. So we're really working to create what we call our golden pipeline of shovel-ready deals in supply-constrained markets that we can then go vertical on in 18 months, 24 months, et cetera, um, with maximum optionality. So we're really excited about that. And um, our team is kind of aggressively out, you know, underwriting those deals. And you got to kiss a lot of frogs because, you know, it's a challenging, it's a challenging time, but, but we're pretty excited about that strategy. I love it. And I should have asked this earlier, but you, you just mentioned JV and then you mentioned discretionary capital. How do you all capitalize deals or how do you think about which, which deals go where? Yeah, so we um we've had a series of uh, discretionary commingled funds, uh, and we have an active one right now with dry powder, um, and then but we've always had you know pretty good deal flow, and frankly more you know more opportunities, and we've had discretionary capital, so um, we've you know have a lot of JV relationships and kind of platform separate account types relationships. Um, is w- available, um, and there's also you know a, a number of times where our fund will, you know, sit in the GP position, um, and we'll bring in a joint venture partner, um, and then basically give the fund the promote, um, so the fund investors benefit, and and you know, we always have to you know make sure that those investors who've entrusted us with their capital, um, you know, are, are you know get exclusivity for that fund, and you know get maximum benefit. Um, but that's, yeah, so that, that's, you know, we like having that optionality and structure and uh, we definitely do deals directly in the fund where we'll do hundred percent of the deal. And then, but if it's a portfolio or a bigger deal, we may get co-invest from our existing investors or bring in third party JV investors and sit in the GP position. But it's great to have that kind of flexibility and optionality because that way we can really focus on what's the best real estate and execution. And then we have different capital solutions for that. Mostly institutional or family office or all the above? Yeah, the vast majority of our capital is institutional, um, large, you know, kind of very large, you know, U.S. public pension systems, insurance companies, um, a little bit of international capital as well from Europe. Um, and then uh, we, we, we recently opened a family office sleeve and started to take family office investment, uh, which has been successful. Uh, that's a great group to work with because they move very quickly. They're very entrepreneurial. Um, they don't have some of the denominator effect issues that you've seen with some of the big institutions. Um, and so that's been a successful. Um, and then we have some, you know, kind of ultra high net worth investors as well. Um, you know, we've done some opportunity zone deals over the years and, and that's been the vehicle for that. Um, but we've been very fortunate to have a good diverse mix of, of good capital sources. I love it. I have one more question, and it's mainly because you're based in L.A. Maybe you have an insight on this or maybe you have none. But I read the other day there was a bank. uh, I believe it's out of L.A. uh, and I can't even pronounce it. They kind of said we're not lending on multifamily anymore. But the real question was around First Republic that I knew filled a huge kind of uh, uh, lending um, requirement for multi in general. Do you have any thoughts around what happened to First Republic? Did did you all bank with them in Texas? We're kind of. Uh, secluded from it all, so I'm just curious what you, if you have any thoughts on it. Look, I you know we we City View had never um, gotten a real estate loan from First Republic, but we knew them well, and I think some of the you know partners here have you know relationship personally with that bank. Um, the, the bigger issue for us is concern about regional banks. Um, you know, for what we do in multifamily. Regional banks play an incredibly important role. We also work with the big money center banks as well, but the regional banks will be there kind of in, in, through thick or thin. And one of our concerns was with the failure of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature and then, you know, uh, the, the, you know, kind of takeover of First Republic is the regulators cracking down on regional banks who are very solid, you know, and, and, and you know, don't have some of the issues that, that took down Silicon Valley Bank, but that there would be an overreaction and they would crimp lending uh, for housing when we kind of need it the most. So that's something that we're 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 focused on. You know, we're part of the real estate roundtable in Washington, and it's something that we've talked to our representatives about, making sure that you know you, you always want prudent loans to be made with plenty of capital reserves, et cetera, but not to to overreact and kind of punish regional banks or or paint them all with the same brush for the, the sins of a few. Um, so that's what we're focused on. And, uh, 
you know, we're, we've been blessed to, you know, to continue to get loans. Again, I, you know, I mentioned earlier that, you know, we're, we're starting construction, you know, next week on this project in, in Air SpaceX. And, you know, it was, a, it was a big, you know, two big regional banks that came in and made that loan. And, and you know, it's critical because I don't know if the money center banks would be there at this time. So it, it's a critical part of the, of the uh, universe for, for what we do. If you're listening to this, support your local and regional banks. They are a critical part of uh, business and American business. All right, Sean, this was great. I really appreciate your time today. Thanks for joining me. All right, Chris. Thanks for having me.